Well, good morning, Greenwich, and welcome to the Monday, September 12th edition of the Basement Academy. As we get off into another new week, uh, we're going to have a little bit of a pivot in our study. going to explain that in just a moment, but I want to open with a morning psalm, one of my favorites, Psalm 42. This is for the director of music. It is a psalm of the sons of Korah. They were the worship leaders, so this isn't a psalm of David. This is from that community of those who led worship uh, in Israel. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night, while men say to me all day long, Where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go with the multitude leading the procession to the house of God with shouts of joy and thanksgiving among the festive throng. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him my Savior, and my God. My soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from Mount Mazar. Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. By day the Lord directs his love. At night his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, Where is your God? Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Psalm 42. What a great psalm kind of hear the, the, the context of the worship leader he used to lead the procession to the house of God, maybe retired from that work, right? Kind of reflecting on retirement, right? Having shared a retirement celebration yesterday with Mike and Lucille, I anticipate that day myself sometime and wonder what going to church is going to be like, where I'm not leading the procession, as it were, when I'm not leading worship. Um so there's just a sweet, sweet, poignant reflection here, but the soul that longs, that thirsts for the living God. And so may that be true of all of us, that we would hunger and thirst for God's presence. Okay, we're going to pivot. We're going to shift. Um, the study leave project that I'm now speaking out of, this discipleship amid disagreement, the, the narrower focus is that, that I've been working on is denominational realignment as a discipleship opportunity. So as I shared at the outset a couple of weeks ago, the, the, the narrow focus on the, uh, denominational issues and realignment, the denominational disagreements, if we could say it that way, theological disagreements, has a wider application. So the last you know, a couple of weeks, last week in particular, trying to keep that kind of wide angle focus that when we're in disagreement, we've got to be careful about the, you know, falling into the error and the sin of Cain, um, where we look at a fellow Christian, uh, a fellow family member, but, but in this context, a Christian as an enemy that we need to somehow e eliminate. So the project uh, has four sections. This, this study has four sections, and we've completed section one, okay, these first two weeks. This kind of focus on discipleship, discipleship as apprenticeship, bearing the yoke of Jesus, being harnessed and hitched to him and his words and his ways, uh, learning the skill of how to handle disagreements, how to live well, uh, learning that skill, that craft, that art from the master. The workshop of disagreement is a unique workshop. There's things that we learn there that we just can't learn other places. But it's 
it's a it's a hard workshop to be in but but the skills the tools the 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 the, the craft is significant if we can learn some things there really it's going to help us in life and so what i want to do now part two this will be probably this week and next so probably a couple weeks on on this uh section has to do with denominations what are denominations just you know they're, they're there but what is a denomination kind of stand back and so part of the work i want to introduce that today part of the work is to try to get our head around okay why are there methodists and presbyterians and baptists and episcopalians and catholics and others right lutherans and you know countless others what are these things what is this creature what is this thing that we call a denomination so and then to reflect on that and then obviously we're having some theological tension or disagreement with our denomination so so want to kind of drill down for the next couple of weeks on denominational life and so it this may not doesn't feel like it has the same snap crackle and pop as maybe the last week or so um, but I but I hope you will listen and I hope you will um, consider uh, what I have to share as helpful to this larger work of discipleship amid disagreement now we're gonna kind of talk a little more about theological disagreements part three goes even deeper into particular areas of tension between the leadership of Greenwich and, and really many at Greenwich and our denomination so that's section three that'll come in a, a few weeks and then we'll pivot back to discipleship and some practical aspects some tools that we can learn so that being said we're pivoting we're shifting to section two of the study and I want to today and tomorrow kind of introduce some things around denomination so a very brief very brief history of of denominations it's understanding that in a sense the gospel story itself when we start to read the new testament there is a feature an historical feature that is true that is present into which Jesus speaks. He moves among a religious community that is shaped by what we could broadly call denomination. So the Judaism of the time of Jesus, okay, that is the Israel, right? God's people, the, the old covenant community. So Judaism uh, at the time of Jesus had distinct sect, S-E-C-T-S, a sect or what we might call denomination, right? They didn't call them that back then, but you had the Pharisees. We're so familiar, but, but but the Sadducees belong, they're still Jewish, but they kind of came at the game differently. All right, Pharisees think there is a resurrection. Sadducees don't think there's a resurrection. There's some disagreement, a theological uh, disagreement, okay? And so a lot of what they're doing, the Pharisees and Sadducees are trying to catch Jesus. Are you one of us or are you one of them, okay? And so they would pose a question to try to have Jesus expose himself. What, what theological camp do you belong to? What, what group are you a part of? So you had the Pharisees and the Sadducees. You had the Zealots. These are the ones that, you know, let, we're going to go take on those Romans. And so they were the, I don't want to say religious fundamentalists. That, that's, that's probably not the right way to say it. But they felt taking the sword was not out of play, right? And so the zealots themselves were a distinguished, uh, distinguished group. Uh, some think that Judas might have been a zealot. And so part of what he was trying to do was to force Jesus' hand by betraying him. He was going to force Jesus to zap them, to use violence and power 
uh, kind of physical power. Um, so you got the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Zealots, and you had the Essenes. They were kind of the contemplative. They were the hermits. They went out into the desert. Um, so many think John the Baptist became an Essene. So he's out in the desert wearing the you know, camel coat, as it were, the camel shirt, and he's eating locust and honey, a very sparse, spare diet. And so, you know, so John, as one of these, uh, kind of like the, the monks, right, of, of that day. So, in a sense, you could say the religious world into which Jesus came was shaped by sectarianism or denominationalism where there were these boundaries and borders and there were um, uh, 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 theological commitments that were had been made and then behaviors that then flowed from that or consequences um, and, and uh, that, that, that flow from um, the uh, beliefs system there. So, so just as a backdrop, the Gospels think you're kind of reading against a denominational background, okay? Then the early church um, begins to take shape. So, you know, the church is born at Pentecost, 3,000. So you got a small band of disciples who are witnesses to the resurrection, who believe in Jesus. They're huddling and praying. The Holy Spirit falls upon them. And then 3,000 plus are brought into the church family, as it were. So, and so you immediately have an expanding community. You've got already some measure of a structure or order for leadership. So you have the apostles and they, they replace Judas. So they have to get 12. They want to have the parallel with the 12 tribes of Israel. So they see themselves as continuity with what God is doing in Israel. So you've got apostles and then we get to chapter six and you see the deacons are appointed to go uh, have the ministries of compassion, right? So you've got the apostles, deacons. Uh, over time, you begin to to read in the letters, uh, the New Testament letters, you've got elders, sometimes bishops. Some of us think those are interchangeable. Uh, and then our denominations come down and, and sort that out differently. Um, you've got pastors at the local level who do the teaching. Most of these are probably house churches. Um, so all the Christians in a, in a city would, would be meeting in different houses, but it would be like private homes more than a church building like we erect in our, um, you know, in our society. And so you have the early church taking shape and it begins to spread. The gospel begins to spread throughout the Mediterranean era, uh, area, right? So you, you get to... Um, a situation in 1 Corinthians, and let me read just a, 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 a brief verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, beginning verse 10, I appeal to you, brothers, this is Paul writing, I appeal to you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another so that there may be no divisions among you and that you may be perfectly unified in mind and thought. And this is kind of the theme that we've been speaking about this, this summer, with the, the, the Holy Spirit, bringing us to unity, keeping in step with the Spirit, etc., like we shared, uh, uh, I guess, last week. And so, my brothers, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this, one of you says, I follow Paul, another, I follow Apollos, another, I follow Cephas, Still another, I follow Christ. Hmm. And so already you have in the early church, and Paul's writing, you know, this is maybe 20, 30 years or so after the death and resurrection of Jesus. So, so the church is getting on, it's starting to spread. Gentiles are coming into the, into the faith, which becomes one of the issues that, that happens that they have to address. Already, people are sorting themselves out into little camps. So Judaism did that over time. They, they, they form a kind of a theological camp, a little family, a tradition, a denomination. So I follow Paul. I follow Apollos. I follow Cephas. Cephas, another term for Peter. Um, 
or I follow Christ. You know, we're, we're the true disciples. We follow Jesus. We don't listen to Jesus through Paul or through these others. So anyway, part of this is just to say the soil out of the soil into which the gospel was planted and then how it begins to, you know, take shape early on. Already there's something in us humans that tumble into camps, into tribes, right? So I'm just saying it, it, it shows up. <laughs> there's something about us. And so the reality is there is always a need in any community, not just a religious community, but any community requires order and structure. Hmm. And so you have the Jew-Gentile tension in the beginning. Not long after the church is formed, all of a sudden these Gentiles who formerly within Israel were seen as outsiders. They were not welcomed at the table. They were not part of the faith, right? All of a sudden, these Gentiles who are not descended from Abraham are coming into the faith and believing in Jesus. What do we do with them? And so Acts chapter 15 records the Jerusalem council. And so the leaders of the early church gather there and Paul makes his report and you've got you know, the leaders that are, that are still hanging out in Jerusalem and they're trying to sort out what has to happen. So, so not only do we default to camps, now you've got kind of an ethnic reality, a racial ethnic thing that tumbles in and that, you know, presents some, some challenge. But the early church has to establish some standards of belief and practice some belief and, and behavior. And so what, what's permissible? Are the Gentiles required to obey the law of Moses? Uh, what about dietary laws and restrictions? How do we address this? Are we going to keep the religious festivals of Judaism, the Passover and Pentecost and the, the Feast of Booths, etc.? Are we going to required to go up to Jerusalem to worship, or is there something else? What is the day for worship? Is it to be the Sabbath, kind of Friday night sundown to Saturday sundown, i.e. worship on Saturday, or do we start worshiping on the Lord's day, the day in which Jesus arose, kind of on Sunday, what we would call. And so, you know, that shift happened. Once upon a time, the early church met on Saturdays, kind of pattering on the Jewish Sabbath, but as persecution and tension arose, they began to meet on Sunday. So Sunday is the, the traditional day for Christian worship. And so you've got all of these decisions to make, and then you've got the challenge of leadership transition. So as the disciple, the original apostles and disciples die, well, who takes their place? And how do we choose who takes their place? Is it the community that chooses? Is it a, a, a person who chooses and appoints? And so the issue of the papacy, right? And so we'll, we'll talk about that uh, tomorrow. Um, so you, you have the early church. We've got to sort out, what do we think about God? Who is Jesus? They, they, they know he's special, but, you know, the doctrine of the Trinity isn't really immediately in our in our Bibles. And so they're wrestling through theological beliefs. Who is God? Who is Jesus? What is this Holy Spirit? And so the Trinity takes shape. Um, the meaning of the cross, the meaning of salvation. How is one saved? Um, you've got baptism. You've got the Lord's Supper. What do you do with circumcision? Baptism ends up replacing circumcision as the sign of the covenant. The Lord's Supper replaces the Passover meal as the covenant sign, the, 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 the special meal. You've got ordination. Who, who may teach? Who may preach? Do, do we allow anybody to do that who wants to? Or what, what standards are there for who we allow to be an instructor or a teacher or preacher in the church family? What about ethics? What kind of behavior is permissible? Uh, are you allowed to eat meat offered to idols or not? And so these are the issues that, you know, Paul and others address 
in these uh, New Testament letters. We don't think of them necessarily from denominational in a denominational framework, but as we'll see tomorrow and in the, the coming days this week, this is what denominations are. They become little theological tribes, right, that gather around a set of beliefs and behaviors. So, so let, 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 me, let me stop there for now just to kind of introduce the concept. So we're not at Methodist and Presbyterians yet, right? You know, we're way downstream or we're back, you know, back at the headwaters. And, and then these tributaries that, that will flow downstream through, through history that we come to call denominations. So anyway, I want got to have your thinking cap on, um, and this may not feel as snazzy as what we've been talking about, but really, I think this week and next are going to be very helpful as we work through some of these denominational questions, okay? Let's take a moment to pray, and uh, we'll, we'll uh, see you tomorrow, okay? Let's pray. Lord, thank you uh, for the gifts and graces that have come to us <laughs> somehow through the years and the denominational changes and twisting and turning. But once upon a time, <laughs> uh, the early church proclaimed Jesus as Lord. And, and thank you for the church that continues to hold out that message uh, despite many changes. <laughs> and so Lord, bless us uh, to be faithful as Christians before we ever belong or think of ourselves in any kind of denomination. But thank you that you preserve a people for yourself. You have made us to be followers of Jesus. So no matter what tradition and tribe and denomination we hail from or are in, Lord, may we always lift up Jesus as Lord. And so we offer our prayer now in his name, even as he taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, may Jesus, who is the head of the church, no matter what expression the church finds itself, May, may the one who is the Lord and head of the church bless you today with his peace, his presence, and his power. Amen.